Hello everyone and welcome to another session of AP Human Geography with Mr. Elrod. We're continuing on in Unit 2 and today we're going to talk about population theories. Uh, so essentially what we're looking at today are just a couple of, uh, and, it's, and it's a variety of different people, but essentially they're either economists or they're philosophers um, who think about uh, the impacts of people on the landscape and on the economies and uh, really kind of what is the trajectory of, of the world if we sustain kind of the, uh, the current trends of population growth or our current social conditions. Uh, so you see the four there that we're going to talk about. In this first video, we're only going to talk about Thomas Malthus and Karl Marx. Uh, then we'll move on to Esther Bozrup and the Neo-Malthusians in our next video. Uh, so the first person we're going to talk about is Thomas Malthus. Uh, essentially, he's, he tends to be one of the, the more famous uh, population theorists. Uh, he's one of the, really one of the first who starts to kind of write widely about this and his concerns about uh, population problems, uh, potential population problems. Uh, he's, you have to consider his time period. He's living during the Industrial Revolution. Uh, he's seeing a tremendous amount of growth in the population, especially in England. Uh, and so he kind of he starts to be concerned because he he believes that there's there is the potential that uh, and you've seen it historically in a cycle that you have too much of a population and then all of a sudden there's going to be some sort of travesty because essentially what's going to happen is is you're going to run out of natural resources for the people to share and so there's going to be you know violent war or pestilent outbreak or uh, social unrest and people are going to starve and die. Uh, and so he was very much concerned about the un what he saw as an unchecked population growth, especially in England. So really some of his main points here, and, and I'm not going to go into a tremendous amount of detail. I'm just going to kind of cover the basics uh, of each of these theorists. And so this is, a, this is by no means an exhaustive conversation. And it can kind of go back and forth between, uh, you know, between those who see some valid points and don't. Anyway, so it's this idea that the Earth has a natural limit to the number of people that it can hold and really that that limit is going to be created by what types of natural resources are available so this sounds very much like uh, an environmental determinist uh, deterministic uh, theory in that whatever the environment can provide that's just the number of people that can hold it. and you really can't do anything about it uh, because you can't make the environment uh, make more stuff and so it'd be very difficult. So there's this natural limit. And so when you create large populations, even in times of abundance, this is going to put this is going to put a, a strain on the natural resources. And so the Earth really is going to have no uh, no choice but to respond in a particular kind of way. I, you know, I think of the Earth as kind of this angry Mother Earth creature that's there to get angry and, and swallow up the people. That's kind of the, the Earth that I envision uh, that Thomas Malthus was thinking about. So he sees almost the Earth as it almost creates a system. And again, this is Industrial Revolution right after the Enlightenment. Uh, so very much a naturalistic perspective. There's all these natural laws and things that are going on that are inherent in nature. And so oh, certainly this is just an extension of that. The Earth has this natural system for dealing with overpopulations. Uh, and so you have these natural checks, things that naturally kill off large segments of population, whether it's war, uh, whether it's famine uh, that exists because because uh, there's not enough food available, diseases, some sort of natural disaster that occurs that just wipes people off the face of the earth, you know whatever it happens to be, the earth is going to create some sort of situation. And if you think about maybe war, you know what are war most wars fought over? Most wars are fought over, or have been fought over historically, over uh, the a fight for natural resources, land and uh, land and food and water and all these other types of things, even. You know, even if they were masked, maybe as something else, or there was a, uh, as you're trying to gain more territory to put your people on, and so this is almost this natural drive of man to to go out and conquer other territories so that they can have more resources for their people. So that's what he saw as the Earth's kind of natural response to uh, overpopulation. Uh, and so when you look at the different types of checks that he was talking about, he had what were called positive checks, and then what were called negative or preventative checks. So the positive checks that he Considered were these violent, uh, these violent natural checks that I was talking about. Just saying, it's, they're very painful. They're very horrifying. They're hard to, uh, they're hard, hard to come to terms with. It's almost this idea that you can avoid those particular checks. Uh, there, uh, there, there's these. You can avoid these particular checks if you will partake in the negative or the preventative checks. 
Uh, now, Thomas Malthus was a Catholic, and so he would not have been uh, he would not have been an advocate of birth control, but things along those lines. Uh, taking um, taking the uh, going out and being deliberate about not having as many children, so somehow uh, somehow creating a situation where people were just not having as many children, and so taking it upon yourself uh, to not produce as many children, so you did not put as much of a strain on the natural environment. So uh, definitely would have been more of an advocate for abstinence, for celibacy, uh, those types of things, so that we wouldn't have as large of a population. There's our dear friend Thomas Malthus, looking very smart. Uh, and of course, there have been critics of him, and we and we've really seen um, the things that have happened over time that have allowed us to uh, create more agricultural resources with less space, and we're actually able to provide for more people and fit more people in less space than we've ever uh, done before. Uh, one thing I didn't mention uh, a few minutes ago was this idea of the way in which he saw uh, the growth of uh, agricultural production versus population. He saw agricultural production as growing what's called arithmetically and then he saw uh, population growing by what's called geometrically. And so you had this exponential growth in uh, in population, where you have very, you can have very large growth over time. In agricultural production, you have very, uh, very slow growth, um, because the only way that you can get more agricultural production is by taking up more land. The way that I describe it is, uh, if you think about it like this, you have, uh, let's say, you have x number of x amount of land available, and this is supposed to be a rectangle. And to provide for your population, you have a field here and it produce, produces one unit of food. Well, if you want to produce another unit of food, you can't, his thought was, well, you can't produce more than one unit of food on this, uh, you know, let's say, I don't know, 100 acres of land. If you want to produce one more unit of food, you have to create another 100 acres of land. So that's one more unit. And so what happens when all of this right here is taken up with, with agricultural fields. We've, we've maxed out our potential to produce food. And so he did not see a situation in which you could actually multiply the output of food per hectare, acre, or whatever of land. And so, of course, that's what we've done in our world today, as we've been able to do that. In fact, in the United States, we, uh, we are able to do more on less land. In fact, we farm less land uh, overall. Uh, because we don't need it as much because we're able to do it in much more dense space. But we'll talk more about that when we get to our agriculture unit. And then, you know, there's these interesting things. This is uh, this is uh, coming from uh, coming from China, I believe, or Japan. Uh, but you have a situation where, um, you know, you have these uh, people that, these hotel rooms for businessmen, you see they're just these little cubicles. One of our favorite things to look at are the, the, uh, the square watermelons cube watermelons um, where you grow them in these boxes. And, I mean, the idea is that the watermelon takes up less space. You can just stack it on top of each other, you stack them next to each other, uh, and so you're actually able to uh, to get those watermelons out and they don't take up as much space. So just some inventive ways that we've uh, we've developed in order to, uh, to take up less space. This is our dear friend Karl Marx, everyone's favorite uh, beard in the world, or in history, I guess. Um, but anyway, just briefly on him, of course, he was more of an economic theorist and a social theorist and things like that. Uh, when he and of course he was uh, he was living during kind of the, the middle to latter portion of the industrial revolution. When he's looking at things, he does not see the world in terms of a situation where there's actually a lack of resources. He believes that in fact there's plenty of resources to go around. The problem is is that you have an unequal distribution of wealth, and if we would take uh, the wealth that is there, and if we would take the resources that are there, and we would create a more equal distribution within society, then you would have plenty of resources to go around, and you could uh, you could actually provide for everyone. Instead, what you had is you had the situation where the the middle and the upper class people he termed the bourgeois, the bourgeoisie, uh, are exploiting uh, those who are beneath them. So you have this upper class, and really you have these two classes inside, upper class and kind of this middle and lower class. And so this upper class is exploiting the middle class uh, using uh, using them to, to make more money and then just kind of taking money from them, uh, which 
kind of concentrates and you know you hear this idea today the 99 percent and the one percent I mean this has been a conversation in the United States that people were chanting during the last couple of elections 99 percent one percent and so it's been a been an idea for a long time but you know everything's concentrated here in the upper class they consume uh, more than their fair share as we've heard of the economy of resources things like that and then that's why these people down here the middle class the lower classes don't have enough and so if we would simply kind of shatter that system and we would take the things and we would distribute them more equally then um, then we would have plenty of things to go around uh, it's a fantastic idea I guess didn't work so well in any country so far that's tried to implement it so sometimes I'm not sure why we still talk about Karl Marx but anyway I think it's because everybody likes his beard so anyhow, uh, those are the first two that we'll talk about, Thomas Malthus and Karl Marx. Uh, and when we come back next time, we'll talk about Esther Bozrup and the Neo-Malthusians.